Science on Google Plus Hangout. Today we're talking about citizen science and its benefits to the public. Um, and we're speaking with um, paleontologists Jason Osborne and Aaron Alford from PaleoQuest and Shark Finder. So we'll, part of our uh, focus will be on how uh, citizen science can get young people and the public in general excited about science. So we're going to launch right into our questions. Um, so Jason, you've co-founded Paleo Quest with Aaron in, 20, um, in 2010. It's a non-profit citizen science initiative that promotes paleontology and geology research. Can you tell us what inspired you to start this organization? Sure. Um, we get this question off and on, so I'm glad to answer it. So Aaron and I, we were we, we had this really interesting skill set. So when we would go out into the field, and what I mean by out in the field, we were interested in paleontology and finding things. We became really, really good at finding. And uh, going out in the field and trying to understand like certain fossil layers and where things are in the field. And we have this skill set of diving in black water conditions and, and river currents and in areas that a lot of people can't get to. And uh, what happened was is we had this overabundance of material that we would find. A lot of it was scientifically significant that we could you know, share with our um, network of paleontologists as well as museums. But then we had this overburden of material that was like really cool fossils that was like, hey, what do we do with this? And um, we started at, in a very small scale going into mm -hmm. classrooms and engaging kids, uh, primarily because people were like, hey, why don't you come in and show kids this, this what you have? And uh, we loved it. It was a it was a great niche. We found we 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 saw the uh, uh, the benefit of the response from the kids. They got excited. They they were like, oh my gosh, well, how do you find this? And you know, one thing led to another. And um, over time, we said, you know, why don't we take this at a larger scale and we become a little bit more professional? Start the organization. Um, start PaleoQuest and uh, try to in in engage the masses. So we literally gave away hundreds of thousands of fossils to to students as real tangible, hands-on um, uh, science in the classroom, for say, and for teachers. And then also we we wanted to help benefit paleontologists um, for. Um, going after poorly characterized fossil formations primarily because we were we had this skill set of going down into black water conditions there's a lot of things to see a lot of paleontologists never had access to or dared to go into those areas so uh, we could pull back that information and share it with the United States Geological Survey or the USGS as well as other institutions and what it does is it advances the science so there's a lot of these components. I mean, it's hard to really explain everything in a short period of time, but that was the major kickoff to to uh, PaleoQuest. That's exciting, intrepid science. Yes. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it, would you be able to tell us about a couple of projects? And as you're talking, I'll share some of your photos with our viewers. Are you there? I, I think Jason may have, uh, his feed may have frozen. Okay. So, so uh, I, I'm really curious about sure. what Jason was talking about regarding black water diving. What exactly is that? Can you tell, tell us? Hello? Uh, hi, Aaron. Can you hear us? Hi. I, I missed that last thing. Uh, what's black water diving? I can't, yes. So uh, along the eastern coast of the United States, uh, the land tends to be very low and very flat. So when trees uh, and plants drop into this swampy water, uh, they rot over time and they release the natural tannins that are in them. Okay. And that makes the water the color of coffee or tea. Right. So the, the effect that you get is this sort of really dark, rich tannic water that is um, if you were to take a bit of it in a, in a clear glass, it would look about like a cup of coffee. And so right. that's black water. If you go down okay. about three, four feet, you start to lose ambient light right away. So of, you have to dive with um, artificial light, obviously. Yeah, we have, okay. uh, <laughs> we have a lot of money invested in really high-quality dive lights. Um, and we actually have found over time that 
the typical lights that one would use underwater are um, white lights. They're not a full yeah. spectrum light. Okay. So we spent spent a lot of extra money on um, lights that have a full spectrum, like sunlight, because it yeah. comes through the tannin so much better. Yeah. So one of the um, offshoots of PaleoQuest is Shark Finder, and that's a STEM education program that provides fossil collection kits um, as well as learning modules for the public. Can you talk a little bit about that? How does Shark Finder works? Sure, I mean, really, how does Shark really Finder work? Yeah, absolutely. We're really ex excited about Shark Finder. So <clears throat> the kits that we send out um, have fossil material in them that Jason and I have collected in large amounts. And so okay. we send it out a little bit at a time to classrooms or to individual citizen scientists. And they take that material, they do things like sift it, break it down into its component parts, and mixed in with all of that dirt and rock are fossils. Now, Jason and I haven't looked through any of this material. We actually need citizen scientists to come along and do these kits, actually do the work that we would normally do in our uh, lab. And so, just to give you a sense of how important these citizen scientists are to us, um, two weekends ago, we worked with uh, the U.S. Science and Engineering Festival and Scientific American okay. magazine to um, put on an event where citizen scientists helped us with our work. We processed 17 five-gallon buckets of raw fossil material in that weekend. It would normally take me about a year to a year yeah. and a half to process one five-gallon bucket. So basically, right. we just regained about 25 years of my life by engaging all of those citizen scientists. So the kits that we, we have been creating um, can be purchased through um, Jason Learning as well as some other outlets. Um, we also have a district-wide kit that we um, have produced with those folks as well, Jason Learning National Geographic being one of our partners. Um, and so we can engage anywhere from a single citizen scientist at a time with this approach up through a whole district of students at the same time. Um, if those students find something that's scientifically valuable, um, then that material gets published and the kids get credit for what they find. So if they find a new species, then their name goes on it in the publication. Um, if they find anything, there are a lot of other ways that something can be scientifically interesting, and if they find any one of those other sorts of things, then their name is associated with that discovery as well in publication. We're yeah, really so excited about that because we get to give these folks credit for all of the work that they help us do. Yeah, that's pretty huge because you can have just, you know, some really enthusiastic kid who finds the next, um, you know, tiktalic kind of thing. Exactly. So yeah. um, at that event I was talking about, we had uh, some children as early as three and a half to four years old making discoveries that we know are going to get published. So that's pretty cool, right? To be basically yeah. a kindergartner younger and have your name associated with uh, a scientific discovery that's publishable. Yeah. So what are some of the activities that are involved with your modules? Because you try to show the public um, how different parts of the research process works. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Sure. As you know, sometimes research is not all that easy to show to folks. There are parts that are just naturally more technical. Yeah. <clears throat> what we've tried to do is make our kits so that uh, citizen scientists and children in particular can see the parts that are a little easier to understand. Um, and so the kits will allow them to do things like sift raw matrix into its component parts or to go through and classify critters, uh, the fossils that they find. They can put a name on it and identify what it is. The parts that are a little harder to talk about, we've been relying on a website at our lab. Once the students send back the fossil material, then we can engage them. We have a little more time to engage them in, in a longer explanation of some of the more technical parts like how do we actually identify something or put a name on it in the lab? Um, and that's, that's been a little tougher, but I think we've, we've got a wiki site, and we are also have been working with our educational partners to build more content there to sort of explain those more difficult parts. Yeah, and we'll make sure to share all the links in the event page after the Hangout as well, so if people are interested, they can follow up as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So Jason, you've joined us again. <laughs> um, let's. I might just jump back to the question I asked you um, before, which was if you could give us maybe an idea of one or two of the projects that you guys have worked on. 
Sure. Um, so, am I still there? I just want yeah. to make sure this didn't drop. Okay, sorry. Um, so, a couple of things is we partner with other organizations like Jason Learning, which is an affiliate of National Geographic and the Sea Research Foundation, as well as Scientific American and Zeiss Microscopy. And we go out and we do whether it's it's STEM initiatives or um, science fairs, you know, to get in, engage the public and students into real hands-on tangible science. Um, that's one of one of the probably the primarily thing primary thing that we do, and uh, we also do a lot in paleontology in the field. We have a lot of projects in play, uh, where whether it's recovering some whale fossils from under under the water in these river conditions that Aaron was explaining, and uh, we are also working on the the first at least the first that we know of uh, dive team, and this is a scuba team with. Ex experts in all fields of recovery scuba to recover some of these fossil specimens before they are lost forever. Mm -hmm. And it's a really dynamic bunch of people. So this is anyone from uh, recovery uh, scuba divers that work with, uh, with law enforcement to um, rescue divers to people that actually work on ships underwater. So there's a lot of really interesting skill sets. So we're really, really pumped about that. That's in place and that's happening. And then we also had this wild idea of mixing science and beer and uh, it kind of went viral here lately. <laughs> so, so it's a, another fun initiative to get people to talk about science and that was the big goal. So what we did is we swabbed these bones that uh, Aaron and I recovered from you know, these black water rivers. These bones were 35 to 40 million years old. And uh, we swabbed them for yeast, knowing that we love beer. We love talking about, talking about paleontology. And we were like, OK, how can we couple these things together? And it was just a wild idea to say, hey, if there's yeast, yeast is everywhere, right? It's, you know, it's, it's, it's molecular biology. These microbes are everywhere. We as scientists, we know this. But the general public really, you know, for the most part, really doesn't understand that. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's just a different way of approaching science and getting people jazzed about science. And, you know, like I said, the whole part of this project was to get people talking about it, the general public. So when you mix the alcohol mm -hmm. component with it, it actually hit a whole different target <laughs> audience. And um, it was really interesting, like watching, watching and reading some of the feeds of uh, uh, some of the feeds from all around the world. We had articles in Russia and uh, Korea and just how they were really excited. It's like, oh my gosh, here's these bones and here's this beer. And so, so it's exactly, it's doing what we, what we want. And, and then proceeds of this project actually benefit under, uh, in their school systems for science equipment. So um, that was a partnership with the brewery itself, and they were going to take some of these funds and um, buy microscopes and consumables for for kids to uh, to do shark find or other like projects. That's really awesome. I think but one just of the to be just to be clear, you're you're not giving that beer to the underage kids, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> so. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that strikes me is... Oh, Jason, you're cutting me out again. <laughs> Can you hear us? You've gone Darth Vader on us. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so we might wait till uh, Jason comes back on. Unfortunately, he keeps cutting out when things get even more exciting. I know. <laughs> so, <laughs> Um, but Aaron, just uh, do you think you might? I'm picking up on something that Jason was just saying, is, and it strikes me that you, the both of you, have really started many collaborations, and I think that that's something that would really spread science. So, what? How do you actually make these connections with, um, you know, breweries and Scientific American and very different organisations? So, um, when we started PaleoQuest. Uh, we figured out very early on that you know, paleontology doesn't have a lot of money as a field as a whole. And so to get things done well, 
uh, you, you really need to reach out to um, other professionals. People have to pool their resources in order to get any given project done. So we learned very early on that that was going to be sort of the key to our success. And um, we've just sort of carried on that tradition. So one of the things that we've we figured out that we need to do is when we go to someone and we say, hey, we'd really like to work with you. Um, you've got either some expertise or some resources that we need. We make sure that we find out what they need or want first for their professional work, and then we take it to them. So, for example, when we go to a museum and we want to work with one of their specialists, we'll make sure that we have a bunch of new specimens that are in their sort of sweet spot or topic area with us, and we just give them to them and say, you know, as long as you're going to publish them, we'd like you to have them because they're in your, your area of expertise. And we have found that sort of give more than you take approach to be priceless yeah. um, in all of our collaborations. It makes folks want to work with you when you're a good partner, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so in terms of Scientific American and the brewery and some of these other more novel um, uh, collaborations, um, Jason's done a really good uh, job at that. He's particularly good at the social media aspect. Mm -hmm. And so um, that has helped us sort of make friends in areas that probably wouldn't we wouldn't have been able to otherwise. Um, and it's not too long before you start talking to folks, you know, that are really interested in science, before you start understanding, you know, where your specialty fits with theirs, and before too long you're like, hey, you know, we've got this cool thing that we can do together. Um, as long as you're being a, a good science citizen and making sure you bring more to the table than you take, um, mm -hmm. those collaborations just tend to happen pretty naturally and take off. That's awesome. Uh, so Jason, you're back. Yeah. <laughs> so next question for you is, um, you mentioned how um, the students are involved in um, the peer-reviewed publication process. And obviously, this is a way to get you know people really excited about papers. I mean, it's for me as a postdoc, that's the carrot that dangles in front of you, front of us. So I can imagine what it's like for kids. How, how does this work? How, how do you credit children when they get involved in this project? Well, the discoveries that they find, they are cited if they're scientifically significant. So if it's a publishable find, which we're, you know, with StarkFinder, we're actually running into a lot of those cases where we have a lot of students that, that have found and, and found something significant. So um, the citing process is, and uh, you were you were talking about how does this um, uh, how does this benefit them as well? If, if yeah. I hear you correctly, so um, just you know, as take it as yourself as a PhD, you're a, you're a postdoc. Um, yeah. Imagine if you were eight years old and you were cited in a publication. How yeah. the direct the direction that would have took you, or yeah. the understanding of the science process, you know, the process behind science. Yeah. And I think that's I think it's one of the main things too is like hey whoa you know I'm, I'm I made an important contribution and I claim ownership of that contribution my name is now in this publication it yeah. also gets them to think about that publication process and hopefully creates uh, and engages future scientists and uh, we're seeing that in the schools that we go to and the citizen scientists that we engage that are getting credited they're yeah. like oh my god and, and they have Sorry, Jason, you're breaking up again. Census when we went out to Texas uh, just recently, last week. And we. we yeah. <laughs> Poor Jason. Sorry. I know. Jason is doomed. Come back, Jason. It's the magic of live. It's the, the majesty of hangouts. So I, I would like to speak to what Jason was talking about. Um, we, we ran a Shark Finder classroom experience with a school district in Texas. And um, we were working with kids, many of whom had been removed from their homes by the local government. And part of the school was residential. And um, these are kids who would really been through some really tough stuff. And I've, we probably worked with between 90 and 120 um, of these students. And <clears throat> some of them didn't even speak English. About a third of them were exclusive Spanish speakers. 
And, um, you know, fossils have this real magic to them anyway. They really just sort of speak to people. That they have just, just really draw people's interest naturally. And before too long, we had one third of the class translating to the other third of the class. Um, and by the end of it, um, they all wanted to know, well, you know, is my name going to go in the article? Of course, we couldn't tell them until we go back to the lab and do the work. But um, I think there's this natural sense with folks of the importance of science. Um, and we sort of just hear about it in the periphery of our lives for most of us, but um, when they actually have the chance to really engage in it and um, do the real work of science, there's this real sense that they're doing something important and they really want credit for it. And we really want to give them credit for it because they're really helping us out with our work. Um, they're really helping us to, to uh, exponentially accelerate the discovery rate in paleontology, uh, especially here on the East Coast. Thank you. I'm just going to check with if we've got Jason back. Are you there, Jason? I am here. Do you hear me? Yes, I can. All right. <laughs> I'm um, the my mystery man on this. <laughs> <laughs> you disappeared because things get interesting. Oh, he, he did disappear. Oh, <laughs> I was too good to be true. <laughs> All right, Aaron. <laughs> um, we won't have to ask you the next question and just wait till Jason jumps back in. Uh, okay. Could you tell us why um, you know this hands-on approach to STEM is important in helping students feel excited and included in STEM? But um, can you tell us about um, some tips that you might offer scientists in other fields who are interested in promoting citizen science and improving outreach? I mean, you mentioned social media and making collaborations with other organizations. Um, are there any other tips you can give people watching? Yeah, so um, I'll let Jason, if he comes back on, I'd rather have him talk about the social media part of it. Mm -hmm. There's some very concrete tips though for um, engaging citizen scientists in your work and the first is don't think of them as your slaves. Um, <laughs> I have scientists come up to me all the time and say, hey, you know, can you, can you get all of these wonderful students you work with engaged in my work and do my work for me? My answer is always <laughs> no. <That's, laughs> You have to give better than you get because these are little humans who um, want to help with your work. They, they understand that it's important stuff and you can't take advantage of that. So what I would say is find an educational partner who can help make sure that you're doing everything ethically and who give you a really strong, credible pipeline into schools. That would probably be the first thing. The second thing is make sure you give as much credit as you possibly can because you know, as a scientist, you're going to get to publish the work. You're going to get all the credit at that level. Um, make sure all the other credit that you can give away, you do, uh, because that mm -hmm. little bit of credit that you can give out is incredibly important to these folks who are going to engage in your work. For example, we have one uh, young lady who helped us with our work as an intern, and uh, she cited her work on her college application, and simply as a result of the public service she had done to science and to PaleoQuest, she received the largest scholarship that her school gives. Mm. Um, so, wow. you know, these little bits of credit that, that we can give as scientists to citizen scientists are incredibly important to them, and they make really good use of it. Mm -hmm. um, Jason, are you back to talk about the, the social media portion of that? I hope so. <laughs> good. <laughs> Um, so social, I, I missed a little bit of the question, so you're probably asking how we use social media or how it affects our science? Yeah, yeah we, we scientists wanted to know how, to, yeah, how can scientists improve outreach through social media and what, and what tips can you give them? Um, it's been amazing for us. So um, basically just constantly promoting what others have been doing with your research has been amazing to us. So in other words, um, like Aaron was chiming in with the credit that we're giving the, the, the folks that find things through Shark Finder. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing with social media. It's like you're, you're constantly talking about their discoveries and ultimately that also um, that, uh, expresses our interest in the sciences as well. So that, I think that's a huge aspect of it because people like that. People People like the idea that if you're willing to share that credit and you're willing to pump other people up, people will, are willing to trust you and bring you into their networks and they want to work with you just like Aaron was mentioning. So that's, that's a huge aspect of it. Um, 
I think uh, social media is also a way just to engage a lot of people at once. So uh, we, you know, I've been learning this process over the last couple years, and um, I'm not, I'm no expert at it. But uh, um, just, just take for instance, like uh, science on Google Plus. Um, you guys were really interested in some of the work that we were doing, and um, you know, it'd be a good question to you is okay, well, you were excited about that. Well, you came after us and say, hey, you want to hang out with us? I mean, that's, that's, proof, that's proof in itself, right? Yeah. And, um, you know, I actually, there's, there's some neuroscientists that I work with, and uh, I tried to engage them into a little bit of the social media aspect of it. And a lot of scientists are really, you know, they're stuck to the grind. They're, hy they're hyper-focused and going in the directions that's the typical academia, this is the way you do it, this is the process, the way you do it. And I think what's happening now is people are starting to understand more of the, the, the social media and the social aspects and how to get their research out there. I mean, places like ResearchGate or um, some of the other um, academia tools are starting to pick up a little bit of momentum too, and it's starting to change that, the way that scientists are thinking of how to get their research out there. So. Um, I don't know if that answers the question specifically, but I would love to know your take on that as well and how you perceive some of the social media that we're pushing out and what it means to you to see that. Hmm. Yeah, well, absolutely. I, I feel like um, it, it's almost a, it, it should be part of the job description. If you're a scientist, you almost have an obligation to speak about what you do because if yeah. you rely on university um, PR departments to do it for you, they're going to skew, skew the results and mess it up and yes. not convey the findings accurately and that's where you get the Daily Mail talking about, oh, latest cure for cancer has been found, <laughs> you know, things like that. And I feel like we have an obligation to make sure that our findings are not misrepresented and that that's why I do what I do and I think, yeah, I speak for a lot of people with that as well. It's to make sure that our findings um, can be conveyed to the public in the purest possible form. Yeah, and I think with um, what I'm excited about your work is obviously because you are doing such fantastic work with yeah. youth and also because you're reaching new... I think you're, um, a lot of the times we uh, neglect to think about outreach in terms of hard to reach groups and that's another thing that I really love about what you're doing is you are getting out there and um, bringing science to disadvantaged youth who um, just by circumstance wouldn't ordinarily get to learn that hands-on practical approach to science which I think is fantastic. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Thank you for the wonderful compliments. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, and I think, you know, to answer your question about how we do things, I mean, I, I do believe that outreach is a collaborative project, so it, it's good to have more, and we need more scientists blogging and using social media, but I do believe that in terms of growing scientific literacy, we need to work together. So making collaborations, particularly across disciplines, with um, industry groups, with government groups, and working together in the public sphere, I think is um, the way to, to grow science. And also a way to grow as a scientist. I mean, you know, speaking personally, working with Zuleika the past few months, uh, I, I'm as far removed from sociology as you can imagine being a molecular biologist before I started working with her. And, you know, there's so much I've learned through this process because of that. So, yeah, absolutely, it helps you grow as a scientist as well. It's good for the public and it's good for you as a scientist to be doing this stuff. That's a really Absolutely. great perspective. There, yeah. there are a lot of folks who think that um, the really great leaps in science happen, happen at the boundary of two different sciences versus yeah. being generated by mm -hmm. a single science. So I, I think that's a really cool perspective you have. Mm. Yeah. Well, I think we're up, um, our time's up, mm -hmm. but I did want to just um, give you both an opportunity if you had any last words, anything else you wanted to share with us? Jason? Um, yeah, I'm trying to catch up on what I missed when I was uh, <laughs> sharing. <laughs> well, you, you did miss the, the ladies calling you Darth Vader because of the strange sounds you make. <laughs> 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 First. So, uh, yeah, if, if anyone... Uh,
watching would, <laughs> would uh, want more detail, we've got uh, two websites, which I think are going to be posted after the Hangout. Mm -hmm. Feel free mm -hmm. to visit those. Um, and we have some other various random blog posts here and there that uh, we probably will include a link to as well. Mm -hmm. um, also, we will have uh, probably by summer or end of summer, we will have the Shark Finder individual kits so people can actually order the Citizen Scientist kits for homeschool kids. Or if you want to do like a corporate um, team building projects, that, that's actually a pretty successful way to do it. You sit around and you're looking for micro fossils and you're actually. Uh, so they'll be available. Mm. And if we're wrapping up, and I'd like to give a I'd like to give one last shout out to a young man named Owen, who is going to help us and be our intern here in the next little bit and work with us to uh, make some new discoveries about sharks. Mm -hmm. oh, that's <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you both. We will post all your links to sharkfinder.org and play a quest. Um, and we'll do a write-up of this a summary, a text summary write-up through our Google Plus and share that out. Um, so thank you both for your time and thank you for your efforts in science, um, in science outreach and in citizen science. So for our, our community members and our viewers, thanks for joining us and we'll be uh, with you again soon for another Hangout. And until then, have a wonderful week. All right. thank you, you too. Thanks for having Bye. us. It's been great thank fun. You. Take care.